Washington, D.C. is my home away from home. I've worked here for the better part of three decades as a founder entrepreneur, policy expert, and author. Probably the longest title. Um, everybody sort of shortened it to ONC for sanity. Mercif sake. Mercifully. Yeah, mercifully. I've learned leadership secrets from many healthcare executives who understand that Washington is the largest payer and regulator of healthcare. She said, well, because you'll never get a husband if you do that. <laughs> I began interviewing healthcare leaders many years ago because what better way to learn how they think, why they make it to the top, and how they remain there. Think about what was your most challenging engagement? Healthcare has been the most difficult problem. <laughs> Let me just say that. We'll talk about that later. Have you ever wanted to disagree with your boss? or make a tough decision you knew would be unpopular? Dr. Jim Deturt is a professor at the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business, and today we explored courage from his recently published book, Choosing Courage. We dive into better understanding courage. There is no such thing as a courageous action if there's no risk. Professor Deturt describes four types of risks and the reasons why it may be difficult for people to balance risks with action. We discuss how to create the right conditions for a courageous act and how to choose the right battles. Professor Deturt explains different ways to manage your message, channel your emotions most effectively, and how to follow up on those actions to ensure they stick. We explore how to build up your own courage over time, as well as how leaders can create a learning culture that eliminates the risks and barriers to courageous actions. For young leaders, Professor Deturt says, the time is now. You can't wait for that promotion or for family or for other conditions to change, except that there will be risk and consider that the most common regret is from inaction. Well, good afternoon, Jim, and welcome. Thank you, it's great to be with you this afternoon. We're pleased to have you at this microphone. This show is about leadership, and you've written a book that's highly relevant to leaders, Choosing Courage, The Everyday Guide to Being Brave at Work. Let's dig right in, because this will be quite interesting to all of us who are leaders. Uh, first question might be, Given your writing, your teaching, your consulting, when did you become interested in courage, Jim? So academically, I, I think it goes all the way back to um, when I was doing my dissertation. I uh, My dissertation was on why people speak up or not in organizations. And um, the, you know, the sort of simple way of, of, of stating the core findings were um, somewhat obviously that when people feel it's safe to speak up, they do. And when they think it's unsafe or futile, they generally don't speak up. But there was a subset of uh, individuals in the data I collected who spoke up or told me about somebody else speaking up, even when it wasn't safe. And, you know, I had made a note, like, this is really about courageous action. And I didn't do anything with that. Um, wasn't the focal part of my work at that point. I didn't do anything with that for about a decade. But during that time, I was teaching leadership classes of all types. And in, at the end of every leadership class, I would end with, you know, a short two, three, four minute thing saying, look, we've learned lots of tools. But at the end of the day, the real test of leadership, in my opinion, is whether you'll use those tools when the big moments come. And that's really the test of courage. And I would just give a few inspirational quotes. And even though we'd spend, you know, in some cases, 30, 40, 50 hours together well, on sort of post-session, post-course feedback, when I'd say, well, what do you wish we had spent more time on? The dominant response became, we need more on courage. Um, we need a module. We need a course. We need help. And so about, a, you know, going on a dozen years ago now, I I decided that it was time to actually sort of speak to that need. And, and when I looked around and said, well, what practical, useful advice is there? Um, that also has some evidence base behind it around how to behave courageously at work. Um, there just wasn't anything. And so I decided, you know, and spent the, the next 10 years saying, you know, let me see if I can help people because it's clearly something people are expressing a desire to know more about. Well, you teach at the Darden School of Business of the University of Virginia and at the Imperial College in London. So how do students today, today's students receive uh, the message of courage and how eager are they to dig into that? You know, I, I, 
I think that earlier in my career, I, I feared that people would say that's some kind of soft topic or, you know, what are we screwing around with that in business school for? Uh, uh, what I will say is it's, um, it is a strongly positive reaction. Uh, I think there are very few people who can't relate to the basic idea of wanting to behave authentically, wanting to have a big impact, wanting to be more innovative, uh, who can't identify with the idea of problems out there that they'd like to solve, but also feeling a lot of reasons to be afraid, a lot of reasons um, to think that being authentic or trying to be innovative is also just sort of some form of career suicide. And so um, I have been uh, really overwhelmingly positively um, pleased with how open students of all types are to really talking about this topic. Well, Choosing Courage is an excellent book. It's a readable book, which is uh, which is terrific. And I would think from the standpoint of any of your students, they'd want to get a copy and dig right into it. We have to ask the question, Jim, as we ask all of uh, authors on this show, you enjoy writing? Yeah, I'm smiling because uh, the answer is sort of, it depends what kind of writing. Uh, you know, the first 15 years or so of my career was focused on writing uh, only for academic audiences. And honestly, that can be a really tedious process. You know, one paragraph is a multi-day journey um, to try to perfect. As I have turned a lot more toward writing shorter articles for practice, uh, blogs, um, this book, I've actually found it to be um, quite rewarding. It's really nice to be able to um, say things with the intention of being helpful to those who want to do something with it, um, as opposed to sort of merely for the purpose of sort of being in some kind of intellectual debate. And so, yeah, I, I actually, I do enjoy writing. Well, do you have a specific time of day that you write or is it uh, when the spirit moves you or you just have time? How, how do you go about that, Jim? So a little bit of both and neither. So I, um, you know, I believe strongly having read a lot about um, the process and practice of writing that uh, if you just wait till the moment sort of strikes, you will be a pretty unproductive writer. Um, you know, writers don't agree on that much, but one of the things they agree on is uh, you got to get sort of the button seat and just dig in and you got to do it all the time. Uh, so, you know, I don't wait for the moment to strike. Uh, I also am not a writer, though, who says like, geez, I'm only a good writer from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. or only in the evening or whatever. I, the reality of being a professor with all sorts of teaching and research and consulting obligations is you don't have um, you don't have day after day and hour after hour free. You have to just learn to write in 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 those half hour you know windows that you have. Well, let's move to choosing courage. How do you define courage, Jim? Seems like an obvious thing. I think we all know, but how do you define it? So I, I think in its simplest terms, uh, you know, there are lots of other components you can debate or discuss, but at simplest terms, what everybody pretty much agrees is that a courageous action is one that is considered to be um, a worthwhile act, you know, something done for a noble or worthy cause, despite some form of risks. Um, so it's really, you know, pretty much boils down to those two features. It's risky action taken for worthwhile purposes. So how does the courage and risk, what's that balance that you found? I mean, the book gets into risk more, uh, but just at the highest level, kind of what's the balance between courage and risk? There really is, you know, because of that definitional nature, there is no such thing as courageous action if there's no risk. Um, on the other hand, you know, we can think of sort of acts of extreme risk, um, but that are just sort of, you know, foolhardy, daredevil behavior, uh, which either because they're not particularly worthy, uh, you know, they're just sort of self, you know, um, you know, self risk seeking behaviors or because they have zero chance of success that we have a hard time labeling courageous action. So in general, though, you know, courageous action is action taken despite risk. Uh, and the question really is, you know, what are those risks? And then how can we learn to be as skillful uh, in our action despite those risks? Yeah, for sure. Well, you laid out four risks in the book. Could you just review those four risks for us, Jim? You know, the the most common risk, and certainly it's true historically, if we think about, uh, you know, writing over the millennia about courageous action, the most 
um, common risk histor- historically is physical, right? I mean, most courage writing took place in the context of military con- conquests. Um, today, of course, in most organizations, if you're not, you know, in the military or firefighting, you don't think about um, physical risk so much, but we know it's true. I mean, if we look, for example, in the pandemic, the last couple of years, um, there were huge added physical risks for healthcare workers, for any frontline service workers. Um, so many people that we don't tend to think about do face physical risks uh, still in modern organizations. Then there's, you know, what we would think of most commonly in modern organizations are economic or career risks, right? I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get blackballed. I don't want to see my promotion opportunities go away. Uh, People worry about what those with more power may do to them in organizations. Then there's social risks. Uh, You know, this explains why people think it takes a lot of courage to confront peers, um, even to give difficult feedback to subordinates. You know, those are not folks who have formal power over us. But they can do this thing called ostracize us, isolate us. And if you think about, you know, uh, our evolved time on this earth, for most of it, you know, 90 some percent of it, we lived in very small tribes, clans, and our survival task was really a physical daily struggle. And to be cast out by the group meant pretty certain death pretty quickly. So it's it's not actually hard to understand in those terms why we still want people to like us. We want people to accept us. And so that's that social risk. And then the fourth kind of risk is psychological risk. You know, we want to see ourselves as competent. We want to see ourselves as good, smart, intelligent human beings. And so often, for example, in the realm of innovation or, you know, in in medicine, you often see this more on the academic side. If you say, you know, hey, why didn't you speak up in that meeting? Why weren't you willing to challenge the science? Why You often hear things like, I didn't want to be embarrassed. Uh, I didn't want to look foolish. I didn't want to stick my neck out in something beyond my area of expertise. And that's really about psychological risk, right? It's as much about how we'll feel about ourselves as how anybody else would feel. If you put all four of those together, right? I mean, this goes back to your question about why are people pretty open to talking about this? I think the answer is because none of us tends to exist in an environment where one or two or three or all four of these kinds of risks aren't present. You answered a question in a book, but I'd like to just answer the, or ask the question, which is why does courage matter? Well, it matters, I think, you know, for multiple reasons. Um, first of all, it matters for ourselves. Uh, you, you know, you and I and, and listeners, everybody, you know, we face a lot of choice points in our life where, even if we don't think about it in these terms, inherently what we know is, am I going to live my values out? Am I going to be true to who I am? You know, we, we, we might use the word authentic. Um, and every time we are, even if, you know, it doesn't go well, we sort of affirm our I, identity, our, our self as a person of value and worth. And every time we don't, I believe a small part of us sort of dies. Um, and, you know, frankly, going back to like students' reactions, a lot of the students I work with are mid-career. Um, and a lot of them I, I learned over time, you know, they'd be in their late 30s, 40s, even in the 50s. And and I think essentially what I was witnessing was people asking themselves the question, you know, I'm 20 years in, I got 30 left. Is this all there is? Is, is this... Is this sort of day in, day out, not really being me, not really creating the impact I want? Is this what my life is going to be? You know, sort of throws like living a life, a quiet desperation. And I, I think, you know, so so one reason it matters is it says a lot about whether we're going to sort of live our best life, our, our highest potential life. Um, and that, you know, that matters in the here and now, but it also matters when we look back, you know, whether you study like legacy or regret people's legacies tend to refer to those times when they really stuck their neck out, when they really did something big and bold and important on behalf of people they care about. And their biggest regrets tend to be inaction. So the science, the study of regret says that essentially most of our regrets are not like, geez, I did this and it didn't go that well. Most of our regrets are, I wish I had. And it's those inaction regrets that we have a hard time letting go of. And so it matters a lot for ourselves. Then, of course, you know, it almost goes without saying that it matters for other people. I mean, if you uh, if you have 
colleagues, if you have subordinates who are being treated poorly, whether that's sort of in sort of interpersonal derogatory, disrespectful ways, or just not given opportunities, not given resources, you know, not taken care of, uh, your willingness to stand up, speak up on their behalf, fight for resources for those people determines the quality of their work life and in some respects, their life. Uh, you know, perfect examples. Nowadays, everybody's talking in the DEI space about being an ally. Like, don't just be a mentor or a support, be an ally. Well, what does it mean to be an ally, right? It means actually to stand up and do something. You can't be a silent saying, hey, Gary, behind closed doors, I'm your buddy, I'm your pal, I'm with you. That's not being an ally, right? right? Being an ally is when we were out there and something was happening. Right. Did I stand with you? Did I speak up on your behalf? And so it's about taking care of others. And then frankly, it's also about organizations on the whole. You know, every organization talks about needing to be more innovative, more agile, more adaptive. Uh, but in reality, how are you going to be any of those things if people won't break out of the status quo, if people won't say it's time to stop doing what we've always done? Um, innovation itself requires a lot of courage because it is about fundamentally changing things. And that upsets people when you do that. Well, you laid out a five point framework, basically, as you say, fundamentally changing things. But in terms of how you both understand courage and how you can channel your own courage, in a sense, uh, the first one is what are the right conditions and how can you set the right conditions for uh, for courage, Jim. So be before I speak specifically to that, let me sort of, ex you know, um, clarify a little bit uh, what you said. You know, you, you talk about five conditions and we'll talk about those. But let me say that really I see those five as as describing a sequence um, that includes sort of what we do before specific moments of action and then sort of how we handle those moments themselves and then sort of what we do after. And so, you know, the, the first uh, step, if you will, is the question you asked, which is, you know, how do we sort of set the stage? And I think in short, we can think about this as really focusing on the two fundamental human social perceptions that everybody has uh, about us and that we have about everybody else. And that is what are people's judgments about what social psychologists call our warmth and about our competence? And warmth is, you know, um, hey, does does Gary actually care about me or is he out for himself? Um, if Gary says he's going to do something, is he going to actually follow through? So it's those sort of judgments that people have about our benevolence, about our integrity. And they matter a lot because, you know, if you come into me today and say, hey, Jim, let's change this up entirely or I need a million dollars for this project. Um, one of the two key questions I'm going to be asking myself is why does he want this? What's his angle? Is it really for the organization as a whole? Is it really to help others? Or is this some self-promotional scheme he's working on? The second question I'm going to ask myself, you come in asking for a million dollars or a big change plan, is, is Gary competent? Can he do it? Yeah, I'm not going to give you a million dollars or I'm not going to agree to upset people by announcing a big change if I think you're going to screw it up because you're not capable. Right. And so sometimes people say, you know, hey, I'm not ready to take big action X. Like that's my ultimate goal. And I say, okay, you don't have to take action X today. But for sure, you can be doing something that builds the perception others have of you around your warmth or around your competence. And those are really valuable. And, you know, um, psychologists talk about this thing called idiosyncrasy credits. Uh, I think of idiosyncrasy credits as sort of a stack of poker chips. You, you earn idiosyncrasy credits at work when you conform. When you basically sort of be a member of the team, when you sort of act like us, when you go along, you sort of stack up these idiosyncrasy credits. It helps people think you're warm and you're competent. Those chips, it turns out, right, are necessary at times when you want to non-conform, when you want to actually say, hey, let's change. Hey, I'm sorry, but I don't like this behavior. You know, you sort of need to push those chips into the table at that point. Well, you know, what the research says is that if you don't have any chips to push in, you're not playing, you're not playing poker. So uh, part of having courageous actions go well, being perceived um, as sort of, you know, worthy acts done for the right reason involves whether you have spent the energy building sort of your warmth and competence. And so that's really stage one. And that can occur over quite a long period of time. It's also why, you know, as we know, um, 
it's very hard for outsiders to come in and make changes and get people on board right away because they haven't yet established their warmth or their competence internally. Your next condition is choosing the right battle. Um, how do you think about that, Jim? I think about that in in really two uh, basic ways. One is uh, sort of choosing the number of battles and the particular battles skillfully. Um, you know, one way to think about it is to say you might choose and win a battle, but it might lead you to lose the war. Um, you know, we we have in our language and I think in many other cultures, you know, we have these stories of, you know, like the boy, the girl who cried wolf, right? And the, the moral being, if you're speaking up all the time about everything, when it really counts, people won't, won't listen. Uh, I think in organizations, you know, we often see that too, right? There's the the person we sort of label, you know, oh, it's the eye roller, right? That person starts talking and everybody else's eyes start rolling, right? Because that person's always agitating about something, always criticizing something. And so, you know, I, I tell folks, like, you got to be really clear on what your most important objectives are, like sort of what's the war you're after? Because otherwise, you know, you, fine, you make a big point, make a big stink on Monday, you get a few resources, people go along with you. When your biggest issue comes up on Friday, nobody wants to hear from you. Uh, and so that's part of it, right? Choosing your battles wisely. And that's really about knowing what you care most about. And then the second thing it's about is, do you have the emotional discipline to follow through on that, right? You know, it's one thing to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to choose my battles. But it's another thing to actually have the discipline um, when every issue that sets you off happens and your, you know, your blood pressure's up and your face is right. Can you actually get yourself to slow down, to, to, to silence that internal, you know, race? Um, can you actually separate out, hey, in the scheme of things where, you know, this is, this is actually only a four, I recognize that the reason it feels like a 10 has nothing to do with what's going on here. It's some other stuff. And so there's also a set of, I think, emotional skills involved with choosing your battles. Most people know what the war is, uh, but they get they get derailed by overreacting to the wrong battles. Yep, I could see that. Well, next comes managing your message, which seems uh, critical, uh, building on the last two points. But how do you think about managing your message, Jim? Yeah, this this is, you know, so this is the in the moment, you know, what do you do? What do you say? And this is the one that we tend to focus the most on and we could talk for hours about, but let me sort of uh, maybe encapsulate a lot of the specific ideas under this by saying it's really about recognizing a bit of a glitch in the way we all tend to think, um, you know, if I were to say to you, Gary, you know, hey, think of something that's really important to you um, and pitch me, try to persuade me why I should do something about it or, or support you. What tends to happen is that you will think of in your mind and you will marshal um, all the data for a way of seeing this problem and your idea that compels you. Right. In other words, we marshal data in the way that we are compelled by. The problem often is that the what compels you is different than the way I, your target, sees the world. Right. So imagine, for example, that you want to tell me about the reason something in the healthcare system, our healthcare system, should change, and uh, you come in and you tell me um, all the reasons why this change fits our cultural values, our top values so perfectly and is a great opportunity to lead the way in hospital transformation, let's say. So you pitch cultural fit of an opportunity. But it turns out, you know, maybe I have a finance background and uh, I'm actually worried about a lot of messes we're in finance that I'm actually driven by um, what's this going to do for the bottom line soon? and um, What's the threat that this would help us address? Well, if I'm if I'm interested, if I'm compelled by threats with economic measurables, and you come in pitching a cultural opportunity, we're just out of sync from the get go. 
Um, and so, so much of it is about know your target. What do they find compelling and framing it that? And then in addition, lots of sort of sub uh, piece of advice flow from that. You know, if I've interacted with you and watched you and I realized that um, when people celebrate your past accomplishments and then suggest to ways to take it to the next level or to develop the offshoot from it, you get excited. When instead, I what I've noticed is that if anybody suggests anything like, hey, Gary, your idea or program is not working very well, you get horribly defensive, then I frame as, hey, Gary, we've had so much success already with what you're, you know, with your program. Here's a here's a way to take it to the next level. And I know you can hear that. Um, I can learn your trigger words, right? I can learn that. Uh, whereas some people would want to know like, well, where are we hitting the ethical boundaries? That would be important for them to hear. I might know that when you hear the word, I'm worried about the ethical boundaries. You hear that as me calling you unethical and you get very defensive. So, so much of what we say is not in a sense in the, you know, you didn't bring any data or your idea had no logic. Those, those usually aren't the problems, right? For anybody who's relatively sophisticated, the problems are actually these smaller framing ways where I can have so much of it right, but that 5% I got wrong derails the whole conversation. So a fair amount of nuance involved in this. Yeah, um, yeah that, that makes good sense. You mentioned emotions earlier, but, but then there's a broader issue of channeling your emotions uh, kind of in this courageous act or this time of courage. How do you think about uh, channeling your emotions, Jim? Yeah, I think of this as being clear about the difference between um, what is often a misconception that sort of emotional intelligence is keeping emotions out of something and what I think emotional intelligence absolutely is, which is being able to read and channel emotions appropriately. Uh, you know, think about it, like in, in both respects. If I, if I want to get you excited or willing to support a change and I come in and I pitch in a totally monotone way and I myself show no excitement and I don't do or say anything to get you excited, what, what's the likelihood that you're going to have the right emotional reaction needed to sort of generate energy around my idea, right? It's going to go nowhere. Um, you know, similarly, like if you say keep, if I say keep my, Good management is keeping my emotions out of it. Uh, if if I'm pitching to you and for whatever reason, you do get quite angry and visibly upset, right? And, I, and I'm playing some script in my head that says keep emotions out of it. And so I just ignore that. The reality is what emotions are is information. Is, is information. And, and if I see you getting red in the face and your voice raising and you lean it forward, that's information. That tells me, Something about this is sitting wrong. Something about this is making Gary a blocker. And the most foolish thing I can do if I actually want your support or need it is to ignore that. Right. I have to find a way to say, to name it, to say, hey, Gary, you know, you're looking, you look upset. Can I check in with you about that? Or, you know, I hear you raising your voice. That tells me you have a lot of energy about this. Can you explain that to me? You know, the, the reality is keeping your own emotions out of a situation is not a successful way to lead. And similarly, ig trying to just ignore others' emotions is also not a successful way to lead. Um, it is about recognizing and channeling your own and others' emotions. So we've gone through and spent considerable amount of time preparing and setting up uh, our Courageous Act, and then we actually went ahead and did it. What's good, what's the follow up then, Jim, to this to make sure we've capitalized on all this energy that we've spent? Yeah, I think that's a great way to to put it. Is is how do we capitalize? So, you know, take the case where you think it went pretty well. Um, I pitched a group of people on and an idea, and it seemed to go pretty well. You know, in my experience and those I've been told about, in very few cases do you go from like let me pitch an idea in a single meeting to, you know, the person or people with the most power saying, okay, we've decided, here's your $5 million and your 10 new lines, go higher. Yeah, like we'd all love that, but that's generally not the way it works, right? Like usually if we're lucky, best case scenario is the reaction is, um, 
thanks. That was great. We should definitely explore that more. Let's keep talking, right? Okay, so in those cases, then what's crucial is that you do those things and you do them soon. You say, great, I'll put some time on your calendar for next week. You follow up, you know, you, you have listened carefully about what the reservations were. And when you show up, you have that data ready to talk about. So even when it goes well, you've almost never really secured the commitments in real time. So you do something concrete about that. In many other cases, uh, what has happened is even if it has gone pretty well, someone has not liked it, right? I mean, if, for example, you say, if your issue was, I think we need to, sh we need to build this department, right? This surgical unit, this whatever up by 25%. In many, many instances, that means some other department, some other unit is going to have resources taken from it, okay? Well, it's, it's a high likelihood that, that those folks were not happy about what you pitched, Um uh, Sometimes it may be that the, the change initiative you're promoting implicitly is a criticism of somebody's existing project or existing program. And you'll see their kind of negative facial reactions, or maybe they actually even say something snarky in the meeting. And after we've expended the energy to sort of get in front of everybody or have that first conversation, it's very understandable that our instinct is like, I want to go back in my office and be alone for a while. But sometimes the most important thing is to say, you know what, I saw that Gary looked skeptical. I, I could tell that Gary was angry. I could, as I predicted that the folks in that unit were, you know, snickering to each other. Um, I'm going to walk down the hall and I'm going to poke my head in Gary's office. I'm going to say, hey, could we talk? And I'm going to push myself to have what frankly feels like a second courageous action, which is to look you in the eye and say, can we talk about that? Um, and. And in my experience, you know, because in the end, even if you have power or you get power support, um, there a lot of people can be blockers and create a lot of drag uh, on any change initiative. And so, and frankly, even if that weren't true, it would really stink to work in an organization where we sort of, you know, just had relational casualties left and right every time we tried to change things. And so I think that follow up is really crucial. You've laid out a very thoughtful pathway to courage or to an act of courage, let's say. How do we practice to become better at this? And particularly, you laid out a courage ladder uh, in the book that I found pretty, pretty helpful in, in terms of thinking about it. So could you discuss all of that for us, Jim? So the basic idea is that, you know, sort of as we've been talking about, the idea isn't just to say, I'd like to become more courageous. What we would hope, right, is that we would become more competently courageous, right? That we, when we would take these actions, despite risk, uh, we would do it in a way that maximize the likelihood that good things happen and minimize the likelihood that bad things happen. And my argument there is pretty simple, that for that to happen is no different than the development of any other skill. It requires consistent practice under relevant conditions, right? Like you want to be a great basketball player and you want to make the free throw in the big game. Well, then you better play a lot of basketball, get good coaching, and you better take some free throws in some other games that matter, right? Um, and so my argument is the same. Like These are learnable skills and the way to develop them and master them is one step at a time with lots of consistent practice. And... The idea of a courage ladder really just is a sort of simple visual way to bring that home for people. It says, hey, um, take not just the most courageous thing you can think of to do, because that's the top rung on your courage ladder. You know, that's the 10 on the units of distress scale. But think of some sevens and some fives and some twos and then even a one and build that ladder of sort of progressively difficult actions you'd like to take. And then do what smart people do when they're trying to master something. They start at the bottom, right? If I want to run a 10K, but I'm not in good shape at all, the most foolish thing I could do is try to go out and run 10K today, right? Because one of two things will happen. One, I just won't do it. I'll never leave the house because I'll know it's too daunting. Or two, I'll, I'll try to run too much, too fast, and I'll be so hurt, <laughs> it'll go so poorly that that'll be the last day I run for a really long time, right? So what would a smart thing to do if I wanted to train for a 10K be? You know, it'd probably be I go for 20 minutes 
uh, where 17 minutes are walking and three are short intervals of jogging, right? And then I would slowly increase that. And the same idea applies here. You build that courage ladder and then you start with the lowest, you know, easiest, still challenging, but the, the most attainable action step on your ladder. And the idea is that in doing that, you will be practicing under conditions of stress because that'll still be hard. But you're more likely to have it go at least reasonably well enough that it increases your motivation to, you know, get out there and run again the next day as opposed to be defeating. And, you know, and what I know from working with lots of people is that when you break it down into sort of specific but attainable steps and you help people start with, you know, lower level action steps, it, it, it makes a huge difference. I mean, I've seen many lives changed by this. In your consulting business, do you ever meet not only just with a leader, but let's say a group, perhaps under the leader, and discuss uh, courage and propose the courage ladder and that sort of thing? Yeah, uh, often. And in fact, I think you know you can take the idea of a individual courage ladder, and you can easily transform that into, let's say, a group or a unit courage ladder, right? So. And you could do that through a simple process of having, you know, folks sort of develop their own sort of list and then a collective discussion where people would say, hey, what are the can we agree upon the sets of things that are both really important to us to have happen as a unit? And that right now, you know, are somewhat distressing, moderately distressing, highly distressing. And then what is a unit, you know, do we want to do about that? Well, what can we do about that? Um, you know, one example uh, Shale Jane is a, a co-founder and CEO of a software system, Farragut Systems in North Carolina. And he started by building his own courage light. He didn't tell anybody. He just did it. And then he started to take those action steps, you know, and he took three or four of them in a row in a pretty short period of time. And he said, I could tell people were noticing, you know, what was I suddenly doing? But I didn't say anything more. So and then one day I was having a conversation with the VP who was sort of in charge of leadership development for the whole place. And I, one of the courage action steps I took is I told him honestly that I thought we had been talking a lot about courageous behavior, but we hadn't really been getting anywhere in seeing it happen. And that stimulated this other VP to show up the next day and encourage everybody on the senior team to develop a courage ladder. Um, he developed 10 and what they did is they created an internal SharePoint document where they said, let's now company-wide, when we take courageous actions as the senior leadership team, let's record our name, the date, the action, what skills we hope we modeled, and let's record that. And when we get to certain milestones, first 50, first 100, let's celebrate those. And when others do them, let's celebrate it. And so what started as really just a personal courage ladder for Shale became sort of a collective way of being. If you're a leader, how do you address fear among employees, um, fear of being courageous? Uh, how do you begin even begin to think about that as a leader, Jim? I, I think in, in this respect, my answer is comes closer to Amy Edmondson's work on psychological safety. And, and I didn't mention it, but we started this talk. I, I, I mentioned, you know, 20 years ago, I was doing my dissertation. Well, Amy was one of my dissertation advisors. And, uh, you know, so Amy and I have talked a lot about the fact that sort of working to create a, a climate of psychological safety and sort of working on courageous action are really sort of these complementary acts because the reality is very, very few. And Amy would say this very, very, very few systems have managed to become completely psychologically safe up and down the hierarchy for everybody. Right. So you can work on setting the conditions for learning behavior to be safer. Uh, but at the same time, you will still need people to be willing to take risky action. And so how does that apply to sort of what I think about for leaders? Well, I think to me, what that says is there's a difference between acknowledging that people are afraid and telling them to just buck up and be courageous anyway, yeah, right. versus acknowledging that people are afraid and therefore doing things that would help change that for them. And so I don't see the role of very senior leaders as being to encourage courage. 
Because I really, I, I, what I really think is that if you're a CEO and you stand up there, you're a hospital head and you stand up there and say, hey, folks, I need, I'm here to encourage courage. We need to see more courage. What you're essentially saying is, hey, I realize that there's a lot of fear in this system. I don't intend to do anything about that, right? So get it together and be courageous anyway. Well, you know, that's kind of a terrible way to lead, in my opinion. So I think what, you know, what great leaders, especially as they become more senior would do is they'd say, I need to acknowledge fear exists and I need to start doing things to change that. Some of that, frankly, would be quite courageous on your own part as a leader. Um, it would mean that when your people see you around your own bosses, they see you be willing to challenge in respectful ways. They see you going to bat for them. They see you being innovative rather than a yes man or woman, right? So one thing you do is you just model the same behaviors you would hope your people would take. And you stop fooling yourself and thinking that if everybody behind your back saying you're the weakest, softest leader they've ever been around, then you are not modeling what you're hoping for. Um, two, I think this is where, you know, some of this uh, language around vulnerability comes in. If you don't ever, as people's leader, say, I don't know, help me. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Let's fix it. If you won't do those things, then you're not creating the conditions for people to think you actually want to be told the truth. Right. So so you have to do that kind of modeling. And then I think the third sort of set of courageous actions that leaders could do to address people's fear is be willing to change some of the systems that, frankly, um, are inconsistent with what you're espousing. Right. So you can tell people all day long. We, 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 we want to be innovative. We value agility and creative thinking and innovative behavior. But if everything in your pay scheme pays for accomplishment of established metrics, then you don't really want innovation. If people can look around and say, hey, who got promoted? And everybody that got promoted were the yes men and women and nobody that's an innovative out of the box thinker got promoted, then your system's not aligned. Um, if you say we want more participation, um, but you continue to only invite in certain people to key meetings. You set up a big, you know, square table where the leader's clearly at the head of the table and the lower ranking people are way in the back. Then you have symbolically made it clear you don't really care about participative decision making. And so, you know, way back, I think 1975, Steve Kerr talked about the folly of hoping for A while rewarding B. And he said, you know, like all the time leaders say, hey, we want collaborative longer term thinking. Uh, but then the pay scheme is quarterly results on objective metrics at the individual level. That's the folly of hoping for a while rewarding B. Well, I think courageous leadership would also say, you know, if I really want people to speak honestly, if I really want innovation, if I really want a more inclusive organization, then w what am I going to do to change the structures and systems and processes that prevent that from happening? Yeah, I love this discussion, Jim, uh, with your examples. It really makes it easy to think about this. I'm sure it's tough to do as a leader, uh, but you've certainly given some steps that you can track along to, uh, to try to encourage, starting with yourself, but others to be more courageous. Let me ask a final question, if I could, and um, uh, not so much about courage necessarily, but just your whole experience working with leaders. What advice would you give younger up and coming leaders? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think, you know, I have been fortunate to work with a lot of young professionals, you know, MBA students in their 20s, late 20s, early 30s, all the way up to fairly senior people. And, and that what that has allowed me, I think, to develop is a perspective that things are not sort of magically going to be as different as you assume. Um, and, you know, that's what I say to young people all the time. They say like, you know, hey, Jim, I want to be more courageous. Um, but, you know, I'm only going to be at this low level when I go into my next work. Or right now I'm only a middle manager. Um, and when I get to X, then I'm going to do it, right? Or they say like, you know, I'd like to do it, but, you know, right now, I mean, I'm just starting a family. It's not really a good time for me to, you know, but in a few years it will be. And And what I now have the perspective to say is, uh, that time you're talking about never comes. 
uh, you know, in 10 or 20 years, you'll just have a bigger mortgage and now you'll have three or four college tuitions to pay for. <laughs> uh, and, and the handcuffs you feel now financially, they'll just have gotten more golden. Right. Uh, and, and so, oh, and by the way, um, it'll turn out that like whatever like illusion you have about people around you right now are not that open and it'd be hard. But when you get up a few levels, everybody's going to be magically more open minded. That's not true either. So, you know, I, I have heard and, you know, and I've in fact empirically looked at this and the level of fear of speaking up doesn't decrease as you go up levels. The frequency about important issues doesn't go up as you move up levels. And so I think what I can pretty confidently say to people is you have to make a choice and you have to keep affirming that choice. And that choice is, am I going to be sort of the agent of my life? Am I going to stand for the things I believe in? Am I going to push? Uh, skillfully, but am I going to push to defend the values I care about, even if it would mean I'm not popular or I have to change organizations? Because the time isn't going to magically appear where that becomes easy. Um, just like I'll never be a skilled 10K runner. Um, I mean, that's the perfect example, right? To say like, look, if you think it's hard to train for a 10K when you're 30, try training for it when you're 50. <laughs> Uh, it's only in reality, so much of what we would like to believe we'll have more time for or more appetite for, uh, it, these things don't magically happen. You have to choose what kind of life you want to have. And you have to accept that there's some risk, there's some pain at every step of the way, but that's what makes a great life, you know, lived in time. Professor Jim Duterte, the book is Choosing Courage. It's a good one. Jim, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure.